Hey everyone, hope you're all doing well and keeping it together. Uh, we're so glad you're joining us for today's episode that isn't based on a past episode. Totally new stuff. Uh, this week, we are looking at 1964's movie Bedtime Story, 1988's Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, and 2019's The Hustle. They all decided they wanted to make it difficult for us and not use the same title. We had a lot of fun, and I will tell you now that we have a very special announcement to make in this episode. We'll talk about it more in the show, but we are very excited about it. But before we get into it all, let's talk about our next episode. The world is increasingly making less and less sense, so rather than fight it, we're leaning into it a bit with a look at Joseph Heller's Catch-22. We read Heller's original 1961 novel, which is only kind of about World War II, and we watched both a 1970 movie adaptation directed by Mike Nichols and the 2019 miniseries produced by George Clooney. We haven't decided yet if this is actually helping our mood or not, uh, but you can find out in two weeks on Tuesday, July 28th. If you have any comments, questions, or corrections about today's episode that you'd like to hear on the show, remember to email adapterparishcast at gmail.com or tweet at us using the AdaptCast hashtag. If you enjoy the show, we'd love it if you would share that with the world by leaving a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Show notes from this and all other episodes can be found at adapterparishcast.com. Dot com. And with that, on with the show, Adapter Parish, Episode 71, Bedtime Story, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, and The Hustle. Hello and welcome to Adapter Parish, a podcast about adaptation. I'm Jeremy Latour. And I'm Arielle Lipshaw. And today we will be talking about four things that have three different names. Yeah, <laughs> just to keep it simple. Just to keep it simple. I don't know what to call this episode. Usually I mean, there's such an easy title for it, but well, this one doesn't have that. Should think, we call it like the most popular one? Yeah, I think Dirty Rotten Scoundrels has uh, a lot of name recognition. Or the most name recognition. Yeah, but also the hustle should be trending because it just came out last year. So but it didn't call do it, very well. But it didn't do very well. So maybe just call it Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I don't know. I think that makes sense. I think that makes sense. So the first thing we're talking about is the movie Bedtime Story. <laughs> Not Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. How's everybody doing? We're checking in. Let's just check checking in. in. Just checking in. We love you. We hope you're staying active. We hope you're staying safe. This should be like a super happy weekend for us because it was the, the 4th of July. But you all, when you're listening to this, you remember what that weekend was like. Like, I don't think anybody really felt like celebrating. I feel like as Jews, we can really be good allies in the matter for kind of reclaiming the 4th of July because most of our holidays are not celebratory. Most, yes. of, most of the Jewish holidays are like... A time for solemn reflection mm -hmm. and prayerful forgiveness. Like, so the way the way our New Year works is, you know, you got your Rosh Hashanah and then you've got your 10 days of celebration and then you've got your Yom Kippur where you reflect, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you have to really look inward. We have to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for, for uh, that everyone should do this, but I think going forward, it kind of makes sense to me that like, well, Juneteenth is like, that's the celebration. We can celebrate for a couple of weeks and learn a lot. And then the 4th of July ends it with a bunch of very calm introspection and not going to fireworks. Right. I think Easter works like that too. Don't you have like Mardi Gras and then there's like the Lenten period and then so. Easter? I, do, I don't know. I mean, when Easter comes around, all I'm thinking about is Passover. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. We've gotten off topic. A little bit. Um, but yeah, fireworks. Don't set up, don't set off fireworks. Don't set off fireworks. I, I listen, if you live in the country and you want to go out into a field where you know you're not disturbing anyone and set off fireworks because that brings you joy. You should do that. You should definitely do that. But if you live in the most, what I recently learned was, is the most densely populated city in New England, Somerville, Massachusetts, and you live in close contact. And I know we're all trying to like, like, you know, like blow off some steam and whatever, but people have dogs, like people have babies. Just, just, just go somewhere else to set off your fireworks is all I'm asking. Mm -hmm. I don't like the fireworks. The dog was more freaked out that I was looking at him. To see if he was freaked out, then he was freaked <laughs> out by the fireworks. 
And we didn't even get to watch Hamilton this weekend. Yeah, yeah we, were, we were watching this stuff. It's been out since Friday and we haven't even watched it. It's yeah. ridiculous. Hopefully we watched it by the time this episode comes out. Yeah. All right. Do you want to get into this? Uh, Yeah, let's do it. How nice was it to do something that wasn't based on like an episode we did before where they had like a book we had to read and like 10 movies we needed to watch? It was certainly different. It was really different. It was certainly refreshing. Very refreshing. I mean, but like all our good episodes, we definitely had um, a couple of late additions to the lineup uh, mm-hmm. that we had to watch that took hours and weren't very good but uh here we are and we're talking about dirty rotten scoundrels yes actually we're not we're talking about bedtime story no well i was kind of leaning into that so sorry so dirty rotten scoundrels a 1988 movie that was based on a 1964 movie called bedtime story and then the another there was a musical in 2004 uh that was also called dirty rotten scoundrels and then last year there was the hustle as you mentioned before with anne hathaway and rebel wilson but in order to talk about all these we have to go all the way back to 1964 and bedtime story uh i i would love to talk about the people who made this and the people who were in it but before we do that do you have anything you'd like to say about what all of these are about okay so the basic plot of every single one of these Mm -hmm. is that there is a beautiful casino town on the coast of france or spain and a middle-aged person who is also a very successful con artist lives there lives a beautiful life has a wonderful villa goes to the casinos and the hotels every night and scams rich tourists out of money Mm -hmm. in various ways And there comes to this town a less sophisticated person who is also a very small-time scam artist and who applies to the more successful scam artist for lessons in how to make more money. And um, they form a bet that they will scam $50,000 out of a chosen person or a large amount of money out of a chosen person. And that person... In one version... Can I just jump in for one second? Yeah. So I do want to throw a big spoiler alert up in front of this because there is kind of a central piece of the plot in the third act of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. If you've never seen any of these, we're going to spoil it. I think you're going to spoil it right now. Mm -hmm. I just want to give everyone the chance to stop and watch it and come back. And we're back. Uh, tell, Tell everyone about this person that they choose to scam. Generally, in three out of the four versions... This person proves to be a scam artist themselves, and it is the scammers who become scammed, but then they all go on to work together to scam others, and that is the happy <laughs> ending. <laughs> the end. Uh, had you ever seen any of these before? No. I'd seen uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Mm-hmm. That was that was the only one. I saw it like years ago. Um, I hadn't seen it that much. I think I watched it. It was like when I was in like middle school watching it on Comedy Central or something like that. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And I remember enjoying it. Mm-hmm. I like Ruprecht the Monkey Boy. Yeah, I that, know that you do. Yeah, that just it, I, I think Steve Martin really does it for me there. But that's I'm getting ahead of ourselves mm-hmm. because I did not know for years and years that it was based on a movie called Bedtime Story from mm-hmm. 1964. Which is hard to acquire. Yeah. We watched it. It is on YouTube. Mm-hmm. You can watch it for free on YouTube in the United States. Uh, you can probably find it on DVD. I bet you can find it on VHS. Uh, we didn't do that. Laser disc. Yeah. Um, uh, so this movie, can I tell you tell you a little bit about it? Please do. You know, it was directed by Ralph Levy. Uh, Ralph Levy did a ton of TV. A lot of people from TV made this movie. It was written by Stanley Shapiro and Paul Henning. I want everyone to remember those names because you're going to hear them for the rest of the episode. Uh, Stanley Shapiro, his whole thing was that he worked with Doris Day a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wrote Pillow Talk and produced it. He wrote, like, wrote and produced like two others of her movies. Uh, I found this out. Originally, this movie was written for Doris Day, Cary Grant, and Rock Hudson. Okay. That, I can see that. I, I, I could see that as well. Yeah, why not? It's not what we got no. at all. It was co-written by Paul Henning. He also created the Beverly Hillbillies. Good for him. And like worked on Green Acres and stuff like that. Now, the people who are in it that we haven't even mentioned, I'll start with the lady that they try to they they try to get. Mm-hmm. They try to get Janet Walker, who's played by Shirley Jones, and they, the two men, played by David Niven as Lawrence Jameson, the uh, the middle aged con you mentioned, mm-hmm. the one who lives in the town of Beaumont sur Mer, very sophisticated, you know, continental gentleman. Yeah, um, it, it, which is in France, and Marlon Brando as Freddie Benson. I love the way that this period in Brando's career is described on his Wikipedia page. Uh-huh. So the 60s is basically the time that he just did movies for money. Because uh-huh. this, isn't, this isn't Streetcar Named Desire Marlon Brando. 
And it's not the Godfather and Apocalypse Now Marlon Brando. Mm -mm. This is I Gotta Eat Marlon Brando. And he did, by the look of him. He did. He did. Years years later. (laughs) At one point, he took off his shirt and you were like, God, you could still be a movie star with a body like that. (laughs) Well, it shows him so much. He just looks like a guy, just like a regular, slightly out of shape guy. Like, can I describe some of the things that Marlon Brando does in this movie? Yeah. Like, Marlon Brando gets buried up to his neck in the sand on a beach and has a seagull like drop in on his head. Mm -hmm. Marlon Brando is in a wheelchair like rolling down a hill at great speed (laughs) and then plows through a barn and comes out (laughs) the other side with a farmer's wife on his lap and they both crash into the mud. And that's Marlon Brando. Don Corleone. It, it doesn't, Stanley Kowalski. It's crazy. It's just, it is It is a side of Marlon Brando I have never seen. And I felt like I had seen every version of Marlon Brando because there's a lot of different versions of Marlon Brando, but this is a Marlon Brando I had no experience with. Yeah, he's like, I wrote down, like this was literally my first note, like mid-period Brando is weird. Like he's, like I said, he's like a little bit tubby, not not by any means fat he just looks like a regular guy still very handsome still very handsome but like kind of just starting to go bald a little bit Mm -hmm. and he kind of looks like he still has his haircut from julius caesar although i looked it up and that was like 10 years before (laughs) yeah i mean he is definitely playing the role of the sex symbol in this movie yeah this this plot becomes hornier and hornier as as we move like forward through time like this plot is actually fairly horny for 1964 like Mm -hmm. they they play a bet on which of them can have sex with this woman like that is explicitly the plot although david niven at that point is like i'm i'm not trying to have sex with her i'm just going to prevent you from having sex with her like that's that's my part of the bet but like this plot is a it's like a sex comedy yes you know and it's it's very raunchy for 1964 i thought i don't know i feel like it's worth it to mention the horniness now i'm glad you brought it up because i do think like horniness can take many forms like there's like okay 13 year old boy horniness Mm -hmm. and like 45 year old woman horniness Mm -hmm. and there's many many other different types of horniness this one really feels to me the like the i don't know the the, horny it's horny for people in their 30s and 40s (laughs) that feels like who it's really targeting well i'm glad you mentioned age because age enters into this in a way that i found unpleasant yeah um so basically the david niven character his whole thing is he likes to pretend to be like um banished royalty and he finds like wealthy women that will find that really thrilling and want to fund the revolution in his in his home country and it's done in a very funny way but he also has this um manservant who's also the well he's not the manservant he's the police detective um who is also working for david niven and gives him all the information about like all the rich women that come to town the rich quote-unquote older women and there's this one woman that they're like sizing up and the the who, what's his name andre yeah um he whispers um she is uh she's rich she's a rich widow she's 36 and i was like all right And then this woman comes on screen who is... So what they're saying is if you are 36, you are middle-aged, like an older middle-aged person. Like she is an old person. And as someone who is 36, I took some offense. How did you feel about it? I feel like... As someone who is 37. I feel like it is perfectly fine to still provide roles to older actresses. Because the actress was 50. 50. Five and zero. And she looked fine. She looked 50. She looked 50. She didn't look 36. She looked great. Like, let's be clear. Yeah. But she's not 36. Yeah. Um, that happens a bit. Let, uh, yeah, let's stay on sex for a second. Okay. This is the thing that I didn't expect. So, Freddy, so Marlon Brando, I mean, I'm going to, I'll call him Freddy from now on. Mm-hmm. Freddy's whole thing, the thing he cons people for is like money second sex first yes sex is the thing that he cons women out of and his whole mo is he basically is like traveling across europe oh there's a whole like subplot in this where he's in the army yeah but he kind of gets kicked out of the army for sleeping with a bunch of women in this town in germany where he's stationed yeah and like it's fascinating and kind of fun and like that's 
It's it's a part that I didn't expect. Well, he's got this, this whole, whole like, con about his like dying grandmother. Well, that's what he does. So he goes up to houses where he knows attractive young women live. He takes pictures of the houses, roughs up the pictures to make them look old, and he shows up at the door saying, hello, please, I'm looking for my grandma's house. She was born in this town. Do you know which house this is? And they look at it and they go, oh, well, that's this house. And then that somehow leads to him having sex with them. Yes. And... I like we ended up having a pretty a, a pretty good conversation about consent when mm-hmm. we were watching this for the first time because he does get consent from every single woman that he sleeps with. Yes. It's not informed consent. Right. How do we feel about this? I mean, I feel like false consent is also not consent. Yes. Which is bad. Mm-hmm. But there was one point I think where someone said I don't want to do this or something like, or you'll have to come back later. And he was like, okay, fine. And he left. So that's like, that's good. It's like, I say it's a different time not to make excuses for it. Just more to explain kind of like what the context is. Yes. I do not how it's treated. I do not think talking people into having sex with you under false pretenses falls under the realm of, enthusiastic informed consent so no that is bad it's certainly not cool and it's, that also, it's not cool that also brings up another thing that i think i want to look at with all of these so we, we need when we talk about every single one we got to talk about the horniness we also have to talk about just the general sympathetic nature of the main characters mm-hmm. like they're giving us two leads who are the antagonists mm-hmm. there are no real protagonists in this movie lawrence is more of a protagonist than Freddie is mm-hmm. only because he seems to have standards and Freddie doesn't. Yeah. Like when, when Freddie says, we'll make her the bet first person to sleep with her. And Lawrence says, well, I am not going to do that, mm-hmm. that, but I'll, I, I will bet that you can't. Because at that point he already knows that she's a nice person and she's not, she's actually not rich. Oh, can I, can I explain that part of it? Please do. For the people that haven't seen it. So basically what it comes down to is, because uh, when the bet is made, they have soured. Their whole relationship is soured at this point. Because up until now, they'd been kind of contentious, but then they were working together. I mentioned Ruprecht the Monkey Boy before. So their whole thing becomes David Niven seduces women gets them to he he proposes they say they'll marry him he gets some money from them and jewels and stuff like that and then he introduces them as pretending to be royalty he introduces them to his brother who is also a prince who has been banished from their country ruprecht who is uh inbred Inbred. yeah inbred and so we get to see marlon brando playing this character (laughs) marlon brando ladies and gentlemen jumping around like a monkey yeah and he's pretty funny when he does it. But I just wrote down that's method acting. Apparently. So then they sour because he doesn't want to keep playing Ruprecht. He's also not making a lot of money on it. And he basically says, like, I'm better at this than you are. And they, that's when the whole bet happens. And whoever wins the bet gets to stay and whoever loses the bet has to leave. Um, if, if, if this isn't exactly what it is in Bedtime Story, we watch so many versions of no, this where they're like almost the same. This is right. And what they do, their mark becomes Janet Walker, the American soap queen who that's they're introduced to her as. Yes, the third main character who we do not meet until 55 minutes into this hour and a half movie. Yeah, yeah she's in less than half the movie. Played by Shirley Jones, who is very pretty. She's very pretty. Very pretty. And essentially, they are both trying to con her. And the, the manner of the con, I think, is worth talking about. But essentially, just to skip to the end, Lawrence finds out that she does not have a lot of money. She does not have the amount of money they're trying to get out of her because she won a contest, and that's how she's the American soap queen. And that's when they change the terms of the bet because now they know they can't get any money out of her. But Freddie says, well, I'll sleep with her. We'll make her the bet. That's, that's the whole thing at that point. That's how Lawrence finds out that she's a good person because essentially... What she was going to do is raise the amount of money because Freddie's whole con was. I'm kind of going through this. This is also this. offensive. There's no way to like say this in a good way. Freddie is pretending to be psychologically paralyzed. Yes, he's in a wheelchair for psychological reasons, and he tells her the only person that can help him is this famous doctor, and he costs such and such amount of money. I think it was like fifty thousand dollars in the original. Twenty thousand dollars in the original. I don't know. It was it 1964. Yeah, it so doesn't matter. Who can say? I mean, us, hopefully, because we watched the movie. Yeah. And what ends up happening to him is, unbeknownst to him, Lawrence's friend Andre overhears the conversation, tells Lawrence about it, and Lawrence suddenly shows up pretending to be this doctor, which Freddie did not expect. Yes. And uh, hilarity ensues uh, for the rest of the movie. Yeah, it's it's a real, um, if you're familiar, which Jeremy was not, but if you're familiar with the play The Importance of Being Earnest, it's like two people each pretending to be somebody else, and they 
each know that the other is pretending and they're very angry with that person. <laughs> but there's a third innocent person in the mix that if one of them exposes the other, they know they will themselves be exposed. So they just have to kind of keep up the fraud. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we come to the end. Everything is out there between the two men. They know what's going on. She never really finds out what's going on. Mm -hmm. She ends the movie kind of as uninformed as she was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And how is... This is what I, I'm coming back to. The idea that our protagonists are antagonists. Freddy is a shithead. Yeah. What is his punishment? Well, Freddy is, I guess, redeemed at the end because, like, he has the opportunity to sleep with her and, does, like, realizes he can't because it's wrong and that he actually is in love with her and she's in love with him so it ends with them getting married like as they must because mm -hmm. of course they were they were alone together and she's a virtuous lady and Lawrence I guess is just going to kind of do the same thing with other women he's like well Freddie's married and happy but my consolation prize must be all these beautiful women that I get to sleep with every day like Everything just ends well for everybody, except yeah. for her, because she's getting married to someone, and she never really finds out what the what the game was. Yeah, we don't ever see him, like, confess to her, like, the full story. And, like, as an audience, we're just supposed to be okay with it, I guess? Yeah. I mean, I had more sympathy for Lawrence. I mean, we, we see that he's actually, other than all the stuff that he does to people that probably deserve it because eat the rich right yeah um but like he's kind of a nice guy like he is a um patron of the arts mm -hmm. he takes freddie around and shows him like this person is a sculptor and like this beautiful art would be lost to us if i didn't fund them and this beautiful music and this poetry and you know all of these arts are flourishing because of the money from the scams that i'm turning around into being an actual you know renaissance style patron of the arts which is probably a good moment to mention, just sort of slip it in there under the radar that we actually did start a Patreon. Yes, we have a Patreon now. We have a Patreon now. Um, we will give the full details at the end of the episode. Uh, but suffice it to say, we did start a Patreon because the show costs money to produce and I am unemployed. So that would be cool. It would be. It yes. would be. But we'll talk about it at the end of the episode. No obligation whatsoever. Feel free to listen to the rest of this episode, even if you have no intention whatsoever of contributing to the Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't know. How How could we know? <laughs> it's nice to have all of you here regardless. Yes. Um, but yeah, we, we do like Lawrence. That's the thing. Yeah. Like, we because, like him the most. Because the minute that he realizes that uh, Mary and the librarian is a, <laughs> is a nice lady and isn't rich and has gathered this $50,000 together, 20,000, whatever it is out of the goodness of her heart, because she just wants to help this guy who's a stranger. Um, he, his, his heart is, is touched and he, um, is not willing to take this money from her essentially. Mm -hmm. So I think he's supposed to be sympathetic for these reasons. And then I guess Brando is just kind of redeemed at the end. Although I will say like, if you want to make someone a sex symbol in a movie and make it seem like, um, they are sexy and have appeal to to ladies. You probably shouldn't put them in like a mesh undershirt and have them ride around on a motorcycle because he looked like he was wearing one of the um, the underpants they give you at the hospital when you go to have a baby. They give you the like the mesh the mesh underpants. <laughs> Remember those mesh underpants? I do. I didn't have to wear. Them. No, I didn't wear them for very long. I only wore them a little bit. I didn't wear them like at home. Um, Marlon Brando looks like a woman who's just given birth. Yes, on the top. In this movie. On the top half. Yeah. Like given birth from his chest. Still looks very handsome. Looks fine. Still Marlon Brando. It looks great. Can I ask you a question? Yes. What'd you think of this movie? I, I thought it was super fun. I, I like an old movie, you know? Like even if it's problematic and, you know, there's stuff in it that you kind of makes you go, oh, that, that, that didn't... That didn't age well. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoy a fun old movie. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really fun. I have some, like, I have some problems with it, and I have some stuff I like from it. Like, I actually think it was really well written. Mm -hmm. Like, as a comedy, I think it was well written. Do you remember the scene where he <laughs> leaves the army? Oh, with the, like, the sergeant or whatever? Yeah. Like, it turns out that he slept with this guy's daughter. Yeah. And uh, I will say this, like, this is a scene that exists nowhere in any other version of this, but it's him basically quitting the army and t telling <laughs> it's him blackmailing the guy yeah basically saying like it, the guy says i'm going to report you and he says you should report me it's terrible what i've done it, i don't care how bad it looks for you you should still report it and the guy says what do you mean how bad it looks for me he says well i mean it just doesn't this all happened on your watch not to mention all of the 
gambling and all the alcohol that's happening on base. <laughs> the guy says, alcohol, gambling, whoever's responsible will be punished. And the guy says, well, that's me too. Yeah. That's you're, All of this is going to have to come out. Everyone will have to hear. And everyone's going to have to hear that I slept with your daughter too. It's one of the best scenes in all of these movies. It's really well written. Marlon Brando's super funny in it. It works really well. Like mm-hmm. I think this is a really funny movie. Can I dig in on that for one second? Sure. So I want to talk about Stanley Shapiro, who uh, was one of the writers on this. And I want to read something that he said in an interview a couple of years before this came out that is going to come up for later versions of this. Mm -hmm. So he said, Although I find social institutions, manners, customs, and prejudices a bit ridiculous, I do not regard them as a satirist. I am a humorist. Will Rogers was a satirist. Laurel and Hardy were humorists. Believe me, humor is much harder to write. It was a lot easier for Will Rogers to get a laugh by doing a pun about the government than it was for Laurel and Hardy to figure out a routine on how to move a piano manually from the basement to the fifth floor. And I kind of love that. Because it is a really reductive way of looking at comedy writing. Mm-hmm. But What's he got against Will Rogers? I don't think he has anything against Will Rogers. I just think he loves Laurel and Hardy. Uh-huh. And I think there's something that's really true in what he's saying about like character-based comedy and plot-based comedy. The things that are funny in this movie are funny not because someone said a joke. It was because of what is actually happening and how things have built. Mm -hmm. So like we know through the plot that Freddy thinks he's come up with this amazing plan making up this doctor. So when David Niven walks through the door as the doctor, we don't need anyone to say anything. It's inherently funny because of the setup, Mm -hmm. because of the way the plot has moved towards this point. They didn't need to like draw attention to it with jokes. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, I think humor and jokes are related, but they're not always... You don't always need a joke to have something be funny. Mm-hmm. And I, w- I just wanted to mention that because it will come up later. Yes. But that's Bedtime Story. Oh, and that's my other problem with it. Bedtime Story. It's a dumb title. Well, it starts out with this weird conceit of like, let me tell you a bedtime story. Once upon a time on a beautiful... In a beautiful town lived this guy. And it's like sort of this narration, but it doesn't... It doesn't go anywhere. It's a weird framing device. Like, it's already a trope that we hate that, like, a movie opens up with a book you at the beginning. It. You hate it. I hate it. But this isn't even a book that's based on anything, but we get this, like, <laughs> pop-up book kind of thing. And it just doesn't... It never goes anywhere. It never comes back at the end. At the end of the day, Bedtime Story is a title, but it's not, like, a good title. Yeah. It doesn't tell you anything about the movie. Yeah. So, really quickly, um, female character is a little underwritten. <laughs> yes. This is the one to talk about that. In. Um, she first of all, I feel like if you're third build and you're only in the movie for like <laughs> the last thirty minutes, it kind of sucks. Um, I mean, talk about like not having a redemption arc. Like she doesn't come back and go, "Oh, it was me. I was I was fooling you guys all along. I was pre- pretending to be this sweet innocent girl." Like she's just super one dimensional. Like she's very very sweet and innocent the entire time and things just happen to her she doesn't have a lot of agency she's just like the nice person that shows them both the meaning of love essentially i guess so yeah i I really liked uh shirley jones as this character but the character herself is is nothing yeah the other thing was Mm -hmm. uh you had a nominee for sir not appearing in this (laughs) film this is a first for us i think we it is the first time we i have nominated a line as sir not appearing in this film well you've nominated uh famous nazi joseph goebbels uh, yes uh, <laughs> can so i I'll, can i set it up you can set it up yeah uh, I, w- I well let me set up that he's not sir not appearing in this film for this one this never appears in any other version of it and it was a line that tickled us it made us laugh so hard and we re-listened to it like two or three times and i don't understand why none of the other versions used it because it was such a funny line so andre is the chief of police the chief in beaumont sur mer yeah and also on the payroll of lawrence he is offering to take freddie out essentially and he's like do you, do you want me to kill him and lawrence is like no no don't don't kill him like it's okay i'll figure this out and he takes out of his pocket this pistol and he starts unwrapping it and he says <laughs> he says this <laughs> this pistol belonged to joseph goebbels it only has his fingerprints on it, on it. No other fingerprints. And then he goes, even if they trace it to him, what can they do? It's a really good line. It's a really good line. The delivery was perfect. The actor's great. It's a great scene. Works really well. See, that's, that's a good joke. 
that's uh, jokes are good. I'm fine with jokes. It's so funny. Super, super solid. But yeah, that joke never comes back. No. So yeah, I guess we're. Uh, I guess like the famous were, Nazi Joseph Goebbels. I was gonna say like they were fine with making the horniness grosser and grosser, but like a Nazi joke was too much for them. Yeah, I'm cool with making fun of Nazis. That's fine. They suck. <laughs> Nazis, Nazis suck. Can we please all agree? It seems like in 2020, this is not. A thing that we can all who, agree on. Okay, who are we talking to? We're talking to people that listen to this show. Yeah. If yeah, if if our listeners can't agree on this, like I don't know where our listeners t- already year, agree on this. I don't know where this year has taken us. I'm not worried about you people. Anything can happen. No, you're you're cool in that respect. I'm sure we all disagree about a lot of different other things, but I think the people who listen to the show can all pretty much agree the Nazis are shitheads. So in 1988, wow, 24 years later, God, this took a turn. Dirty rotten scoundrels. This is the one I'm assuming most people know, even if they haven't seen it. Like, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, I think, is part of the culture shown on cable a million times. And they made a musical out of it and stars Steve Martin and Michael Caine, two b- real big movie stars, you big know? Big stars, big stars. Big stars. Directed. Can I, I want to talk about uh, so many different things. Uh, can I get two things out of the way really quickly? Yes. One. How much of a fucking better title is Dirty Rotten Scoundrels than Bedtime Story? It's way better. It's so much better. It tells you everything you need to know about this movie. It's My absolute favorite part after watching the entire thing, my favorite part of this movie is the title. And my second favorite part is the teaser trailer that they made for it. It's like a minute long. I'm going to link to it in the show notes. It's like a beautiful little short film that does not appear in the movie telling you everything you need to know about these characters and everything you need to know about the tone of the movie. Mm -hmm. It's so good. But the second thing is who directed it. This was directed by Frank Oz. Mm. I want to talk about Frank Oz's career up until this point. Not as an actor, because as an actor, we all know that he's most famous for playing Yoda, Mm -hmm. Grover, Miss Piggy. Yeah. He's Frank Oz. Iconic characters. Maybe more iconic than all of them. Sam the Eagle. Yeah. Who all kind of have the same voice. I mean, a little bit. Yeah. But that's fine. That's how it works. as anyone would... So characters played by the same person. This was Frank Oz's directorial career for a period of about six years. His first, one of his first credits was co-directing The Dark Crystal with Jim Henson. Mm -hmm. Then two years later, he directed The Muppets Take Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Then two years after that, he directed Little Shop of Horrors, Mm -hmm. which did very well. And then he directed Dirty Rotten Scoundrels two years later. What you're saying is this is his first non-puppet movie. This is... Yes, his first non-puppet movie. His first non-puppet movie. And he you you found it very tickling that Yoda was directing Emperor Palpatine. Yeah, Ian McDermott is in this as the butler, yeah. uh, as Arthur. And that it just tickles me. Five years after Jedi comes out, Yoda's directing Palpatine. Yeah. I just think it's delightful and it tickles me. Yes. Uh, I think it's amazing. Frank Oz's career blows me away. I just think it's amazing how he just kind of walked in, said, I'm very confident. I know what I'm doing. And I'm not saying his movies are my favorite movies of all time, but like they are incredibly good movies. Mm-hmm. And he's a really, really competent, funny director. And... How to, to, in those few years, go to making this movie with this kind of cast, I think is pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was written by Dale Lawner. And then we start a new, uh, a new tradition of mentioning Shapiro and Henning in the credits for every single one of these. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the production. Talking about the cast for a second, can I tell you some things that I found out about the cast of this movie? Yes, you can. Originally, uh, Dale Lawner, the new screenwriter, was developing this for Mick Jagger and David Bowie. Wow. They dropped out to do a movie with Martin Scorsese. I think that's better. Uh, for them, I'd say, yeah, for, for everyone. everyone. For everyone for involved. Everyone. Uh, I'd be interested to see it. <laughs> uh, here's a couple of other people that were considered for this. Uh, Eddie Murphy was apparently considered for the Freddie Benson role. I can totally see that. I can see it too. John Cleese was considered for Lawrence Jameson. Yeah, I can see that. He dropped out quote unquote reluctantly uh-huh. and apparently for years regretted the decision. Oh. Um then they went to Michael Palin for Jameson. Okay. And he apparently read for it, but he was like, I'm wrong for this. Yeah. And dropped out. Uh then just the way this all happened was really funny to me because uh Oz had already worked with Steve Martin on Little Shop of Horrors. So they had already formed a relationship at this point. Richard Dreyfus was brought in to read for Freddie Benson. Mm-hmm. He fucked up. And thought he was reading for Jameson. Oh, no. So they had Steve Martin, who was reading for Jameson, read for Freddie Benson. Oh, that's funny. And Oz was like, well, Dreyfus, thank you for coming in, but no, thank you. I'm fine. But Steve, I think you might be our Freddie. And that was how he was cast. That's great. And then they got Michael Caine. I mean. Who... 
How can you go wrong? It's it's one of those things where in retrospect, like who could be better? Yeah. No one could be better. Who who is a better David N- Niven type in 1988 than Michael Caine? Yeah. Also, kind of in his mid career, <laughs> like we're talking post Alfie, but pre Cider House Rules, Michael Caine, <laughs> pre Batman, right? Like he's kind of in a weird little period, but he's still a fucking movie star. Yeah, I feel like men in their like 40s and 50s for movies. I mean, unless you're going to just ignore the fact that they're 50 and pair them up with like a 25 year old woman as their romantic lead. It's, it's a weird time. It's a hard time. It's hard to be in your 40s. Well, speaking of the romantic lead, there's Glenn Headley. Yeah. As Janet Colgate, mm-hmm. who's the new the new Shirley Jones. There's some cool women in this as well. Dana Ivey's in this. For, yeah. Sh- briefly. Francis Conroy's in this. Very briefly. Yeah. They're in the main credits. I, it's, it was so weird because I was like, oh, Francis Conroy. She's six feet under. And she was on screen for probably... 25 seconds and i don't think she even had any lines she had some lines no remember she just like kept getting interrupted by ruprecht at the table she never really actually like got through her sentence and then she was just not in anymore well no she asked why there was a cork on the fork yes i do remember that yeah so she gets to set up the joke Um, (laughs) but as as far as this movie goes uh where do you want to start with this one i think it was like better in some ways and slightly less good in other ways interesting um i mean the whole third act is way better yeah um the whole plot with the young american woman mark being also a con artist herself and flipping the whole thing back around on them is invented in this version and like we finished watching and you turned to me and you were like that is such a better ending and i was like i agree the the ending is significantly better well because i went through all of bedtime story kind of waiting for the reveal Mm -hmm. i was waiting for shirley jones to just turn around and say haha i got you boys yeah and it never happens never happens and it made it like less interesting at that point Mm -hmm. but yeah the end of this one is brilliant yeah it's so much better i guess i would say on the flip side they didn't spend as much time setting up steve martin's whole scam nearly nearly as much because they had to allot him extra time to just kind of be goofy Steve Martin, I guess. Yes. Um, so in Bedtime Story, when Marlon Brando comes in in the wheelchair, and this is the first time that um, David Niven has seen him do this version of the scam, and he's he's having people kind of take pity on him, he starts talking about his grandmother. And it's like the eighth time we've seen him do this scam about his his dying grandmother and he needs the money for her and blah 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 blah. so it it is interesting and flows really nicely that you see like oh he's got this one thing and he does it and it really works really well and he's just kind of upping the ante in this case with the whole wheelchair situation and in this one steve martin's got a whole bunch of different things that he does so when he comes in with the wheelchair it's also the first time we've heard about his his dying grandmother and so it's it's makes him I don't know if it's less interesting of a character, but certainly doesn't like set him up in the same in the same way. I liked I liked it better in the first one that we had that little bit of background. Mm. I think that they make up for it with kind of general charisma. Yeah. Like I think Steve Martin sells the version of the character just through his acting mm-hmm. um, less so than what the plot is doing for him. Yeah. Um, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. I think it's two different ways of doing it. This one didn't bother me as much only because I liked Steve Martin as this character more than I liked Marlon Brando as this character. Yeah. I mean, he's a very different version of this character. I mean, he's like sloppy and goofy and loud. And I don't think Marlon Brando is really any of those any of those things he's more like seductive and that was the thing about it that was the thing i didn't like him because marlon brando was just so creepy yeah yeah he's yes i agree i agree with that i'm just saying it's different yeah no it totally is and we also don't meet freddie for a while because in the original one like you meet marlon brando way before he meets david niven we get to see his whole his whole shtick the way he gets women all that kind of stuff and then he they basically have their introduction on the train Mm mm-hmm and in this one, the introduction on the train is our first scene with Steve Martin. Mm-hmm. And that was a change. But I think Steve Martin makes that introduction work really well. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, I didn't, I'm not saying I loved Steve Martin in this movie, but Steve Martin is Steve Martin. Like he has a charisma yeah. about him that I think is really suited to this character. Yeah. I mean, and I will never not like Michael Caine in something. Like no. something would have, Michael Caine would have to just really be phoning it in for me not to enjoy his performance. Even in this, like he gets a chance to kind of work his like Michael Caine muscles um, Michael Caine does this thing. We've talked about this before, I think, on the podcast that no, no one else can do. He can just bring tears to his eyes. Like you're just looking at him and the camera is on him and it does not waver and the tears just come to his eyes. They don't fall. He just gets misty and he does it 
so beautifully. He does it in like every movie that he's in because it's such a talent. And he definitely does it in this one. And I thought it was I thought it was just great. And then it turns around that like he was sympathetic for for no reason because he was being scammed. And he's got he does something in this that I don't think this version of the character does in any other one that we watched, which is that when he realizes he's been scammed himself, it's kind of this like Sherlock Holmes, Irene Adler thing that Mm -hmm. he's he's proud of her. He's like that was amazing. She was so good. I love that I encountered someone who does what I do even better, and I'm full of admiration. I really think the last like 10 minutes of the movie are the best 10 minutes of the movie, mm-hmm. which is great. Like It's really great in a comedy. One of the things that I find with a lot of comedies, especially ones that are like more than 90 minutes long, I feel like 90 minutes is kind of where a comedy usually wears out its welcome. A lot of comedies, I think, really lose a lot of momentum in the third act. Mm-hmm. This is one where I think the momentum really builds. Yeah. And those last 10 minutes are like the most fun of the entire movie. And it's great to end a movie wanting more yeah. rather than saying like, oh, I'm glad it's over. Yeah. I mean, so you you kind of think it's over. And then there's this fun epilogue that they're sitting on Michael Caine's beautiful villa and Freddie's like about to go and they've been scammed and it's like a week or two later and then who should come trooping up the walk than this party of tourists led by Glenn Headley in a in a totally different outfit different hair like different accent and she just shows up and she's like ah yes here is what is what is he he's supposed to be Greek he's supposed to be Australian Australian so she's leading a bunch of Greek people she's leading a bunch of Greek people um who want to invest in real estate and she's like here's this great Australian and it's a beautiful example of yes anding because he just looks at her and there's this like just moment of silence like is he gonna go along with it is he gonna go along with it and then he just goes good day mate <laughs> and you're just like yeah it's really beautiful. Yeah. And she fucking sells it in that scene. It's yeah. one of those things where like, I, you know, I haven't seen Glenn Headley in as much as I've seen Steve Martin or Michael Caine. She was on ER. Yeah. I mean, I've seen her in a lot of things. She's Glenn Headley. Yeah. She's, she's, a, she's, a, a, she's a, a real person um, who is in movies. But the role she plays in this movie, I think it would be kind of easy to overlook her acting mm-hmm. because she's playing someone who's just so innocent. Mm-hmm. It's not a really deep character. The, the part that she's playing for most of it. But then when she walks in at the end, I think you really get a sense for how talented she is as an actor mm-hmm. because she is genuinely a different person at this point. Mm-hmm. Genuinely a different person. And I was just really impressed with her. And she not only at this point is more intelligent than these two idiots... <laughs> At this point, I was more impressed by her acting ability than I was with either of these guys. Yeah. Like, I think she steals the last 10 minutes of the movie and Michael Caine and Steve Martin are there. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. Well, because the the sort of moral of the story, the place that they end up, like talk about the female character being a good, strong character, is they kind of end up in deference to her. They're like, oh, okay, she's our leader now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're we're all going to be together and she does this better than we do and she is now, she is now our boss. We're, We're totally fine um because she's like i made like six million dollars last year and they're like cool we would like some of that please yes <laughs> it's so much better it's so much better it's just a fun movie i mean i go back to frank oz's i called him confident before mm-hmm. that's the thing about this movie that i really like it's not trying too hard it's a very relaxed comedy it's not hitting you over the head with jokes every five minutes. Mm-hmm. It's just, here's our setup. Here are our characters. We are trusting that the you, the enjoyment that you find in the story is going to come from understanding what's happening, understanding what motivations are, understanding the subtext. And when one of them double crosses the other, we think you're going to find it funny because you've gotten to know these characters and you know that they don't want that. Mm-hmm. I think that's where the humor comes from. There are some really good jokes in it, but I think it just, as far as a good, genuine character-based comedy, I think it's just really solid. Mm -hmm. Really, really solid. Totally. So that's Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. So next we have to talk about Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, colon, the musical. (laughs) Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, exclamation point. Actually, it doesn't. No. Uh, From 2004, it was uh, written music and lyrics by David Yazbek, Mm -hmm. book by Jeffrey Lane. Mm -hmm. And I can say that in the original cast, we have John Lithgow as Lawrence Jameson, Mm -hmm. an actor I I adore, Mm -hmm. wonderful, and an actor named Norbert Leo Butts as Freddie Benson. It's the greatest name in show business. I had no idea who this man was. And that's not because of him. It's just because I don't know a ton about theater. This This is a very, very 
well-known musical theater guy. He was in the original cast of the last five years. He uh, was one of the original Rogers in Rent. He was in Wicked. Like he's 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 a guy. I believe you. Yes. I feel like I needed you. So we watched this today. Mm-hmm. Uh, we found while everyone else in the fucking world was watching <laughs> Hamilton on Disney Plus, <laughs> we were we were watching a bootleg, shitty bootleg, a shitty bootleg of 2004's Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. So shitty was this bootleg that we literally had to watch it on an iPad instead of on the TV because the shaking was so bad that it was giving me motion sickness. So at least on the iPad I could look away, <laughs> but the TV was just always this movement in the corner of my eye. It was terrible. So right off the bat, let's just say, like, let's acknowledge, like, we did not watch this in the in the way it was originally intended to be seen. Yes, less than optimal circumstances, to say the least. But I feel like a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the things we're going to say about it, we can say based on what we saw, mm-hmm. even if we weren't there in the theater at the time. Uh, I, but I needed you for a lot of this. I feel like I asked you a lot of questions while we were watching it about, like, the context. You knew a lot of the people in it that I didn't really know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you knew a little bit more about... So, like, it ran for about 600-something performances. Yeah. To mixed reviews. Yeah. Uh, famously, famously mixed reviews. <laughs> mixed. I, be, I believe the, the one common uh, trait in all of the reviews for it was... It's a musical. It's okay. It ticks all the boxes. It sure has lyrics that rhyme. It's got uh, actors sing the songs. I mean, Norbert Leo Butts won the Tony that year for best actor in a musical. Like, that's that's not nothing. No. No, it's not nothing. It's something. 600 performances. Is that good? Is that? Yeah, I mean, that's like a two-year run, and it got like a tour and a West End performance, and like, I happen to know it's had a very healthy career as like a, you know community and regional theater Mm -hmm. play because it's not challenging no (laughs) uh it doesn't really require any of the leads to be really really good at something (laughs) there's like some singing (laughs) there's some dancing do you know what i mean like you can kind of if you're if say you're a community theater and you've got a guy that's like really charismatic but like he sings okay and doesn't really dance like he can talk sing his way through either of these roles easily well if we're looking at from the community theater standpoint so let's say uh the theater did my fair lady like a year ago yeah and now they're doing dirty rotten scoundrels yeah they're gonna get the guy who played henry higgins to play lawrence jameson yes like it's that type i would say what play do you think they did that would lead to them casting a freddy for this i'm just thinking okay so if they did the music man i think harold hill would be jameson not freddy Mm. if they did fiddler on the roof okay (laughs) perchick would be freddy okay I'm so happy that we got to talk about Fiddler on the Roof again. Yet again. again. <laughs> that works. No, that totally works. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And who would be the the lady? Any lady. Just a lady that can sing. It's, I mean, such is the theater. Yes. And if we want to talk about general inequities in the theater, we could talk about that. But uh, I think that's usually how it works. Yeah. When I was in high school, when I was a senior in high school, I think about this all the time when that stuff comes up. We did a funny thing happen on the way to the forum. If you are a guy in a high school production of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, what are you playing? What is the type of character that you are playing? Yeah, a couple of you are playing a slave. All right. Mm-hmm. That's not great. What, what what else might you be playing? Oh, I don't know the show, You, but please enlighten me. Well, you could be the master of a house. Mm-hmm. You could be uh, a general. Uh-huh. You could be a soldier. Uh-huh. You could be all kinds of different things if you're a guy. Uh-huh. If you're a woman, uh-huh. you have two choices. Yes. You can be the one shrill harpy mm-hmm. or... You can be a sex worker. Oh boy. Those are your options. That's why I don't think they should do Miss Saigon in high schools. I really have a problem with mm-hmm. it. I like I look back on doing forum with such fond memories because it's such a funny show. But like if someone came to me and said, oh, did you know we all decided no one's ever doing forum again? I would look at that person and go, well, hang. I'm fine with that. Yeah. That's fine. I get it. I, I get am, it and I'm fine with that. I am, if, if there is, I've said this many times, if there's one area of my life that I'm very conservative in. It's like what productions are appropriate for high school theaters to do. Mm. And it's, it has nothing to do with being like explicit about sex or drugs or anything. Like I think rent is fine for high schoolers to do. I don't like do I don't like it when high schools do musicals that if you are for a 14 year old ninth grader and you want to be in the chorus the only option for you is to play like an exotic dancer I really don't think that's cool I don't like it that is thank you for coming to my TED talk <laughs> but anyway getting back to Dirty Rotten Scoundrels the musical it's okay mm-hmm. I okay do you want to talk about some good stuff really quickly I don't want to spend a ton of time on it yeah uh they keep the title they keep the title it's a good title they expand the roles for both um 
the the one older what is it fanny of omaha fanny eubanks of omaha fanny eubanks yeah. of omaha although i think her name is different in this and andre they give them so fanny eubanks is played by joanna gleason and i guess they just wanted to give her more to do because she's a very famous actress and uh so they gave her and andre a love story um which i didn't quite follow that well um, I followed it. I saw what was going on. I just didn't give just, a shit about it. I didn't give a it. shit. It always surprises me with bootlegs. Not that I, I don't agree with making bootlegs. So it's not like I watch them that often. But, I, you know, once or twice I've seen a bootleg uh, of a Broadway show. It always surprises me how good the sound is. Like you can always hear the dialogue and the, sing- the lyrics so clearly. And I think it must be because the acoustics are so good in those theaters. Um, Speaking of the lyrics, there is a reference to David Niven in one of the in the opening song there to uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Well, there's so many like um, like breaking down the third wall like theater jokes and references in this okay i have something to say about Uh, that okay this is some context i did have yeah i firmly believe that this is a fucking out and out ripoff of the producers yeah and i know i'm not the only person to think that because we saw that in some of the reviews for it didn't we uh i don't remember seeing that but like it's pretty obvious it's like someone was like okay What's a property that's a movie from the 60s that we can cast two kind of schmucky guys. Or the 80s in this case. Well, the 80s, but I guess I'm thinking of the 64 movie. Mm -hmm. To play these lead roles and we can just kind of, no shade on David Yazbek, but like this seems thrown together. Like it's not that good. Like it's okay. It's just not transcendent. A lot of the lyrics really feel like placeholders to me. Mm -hmm. Like Freddie Gets an I Want song. Mm -hmm. I, I will go on the record and say that I would love to see shows that don't have i want songs i know that like you've told me that you can't do that yeah i i'm fine not seeing it but they have to give freddie and i want song and the thing he wants is to be rich like Lawrence is. Mm-hmm. and the song is called great big stuff yeah. and it's just him talking about how much he wants great big stuff and that's like the chorus God, we got jeremy to sing on the podcast i think that might be a first i, I sing on the show all the time i sang in jaws <laughs> okay that was episode 19 that was a J- long time ago that. yeah uh, which, by the way, we watched for the 4th of July. That's how we celebrate in this house. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that's the title of the song, and it's the refrain. That doesn't feel... That's kind of like if Yesterday was still called Scrambled Eggs yeah. when it came out on the album. Mm-hmm. Like, that was the placeholder title. But then he came up... Then McCartney came up with Yesterday, and mm-hmm. that's a much better title that fits that. Yazbek never came up with anything better than Great Big Stuff. Great Big Stuff. It does not feel like it's finished. It feels unfinished to me. Mm -hmm. Well, it does. I think it's that song. It has one of my like lyrical pet peeves, which is the line, know the score, which is something that no one says ever, but is in like every musical theater theater lyric because score is really easy to rhyme. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Really bothers me. There's also like... I mean, again, I just said I'm no prude, but there's like a line. This this song in particular ages so poorly. Oh, yeah. Almost worse than any song I've heard, like from the last 20 years. There's like a joke about getting a Hummer in your Hummer, which is disgusting. Which is like it's it's gross and horny and also outdated because we don't have those anymore. Yeah. The car. The car. <laughs> I assume, I don't know what the kids are doing these days. I, I don't either. I'm I'm I have a child. Um, there's a part where he like kind of makes fun of rappers, which is is not a good look. Yeah, it's a bad look. I'm not even going to repeat what he said. He's really dismissive over whether Puff Daddy it was Puff Daddy or P Diddy. Yeah, but like it's clear who the audience is. It's clear that they didn't expect that anyone in the audience would either be black or into hip hop. Well, it also it also um, neatly makes sure that no one black can ever play this role. Because he's making fun yes. of black people in mm-hmm. a shitty way, mm-hmm. um, which clearly no one thought about. Because there's well, no, cause you just said Eddie Murphy almost played this role in, in the movie, which would have been gr- like, there's no reason a black actor couldn't play this role. That's how, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. I'm even angrier now than I was before. Yeah. Well, he perfectly aligns himself with that because he says he wants to be like Trump. Yeah. Well, that th- that was my that was my next point. And then he <laughs> says he wants to be like Trump. And we looked at each other like, Jesus Christ. Just can't get any worse. <laughs> and then it did. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just I thought th- I thought there was a lot of a lot of lazy writing in yeah. this musical. And I read on the Wikipedia page, it kind of um, distilled some of the some of the different critics reactions. And a lot of the critics kind of said the same thing. Um, ben Brantley, of the New York Times um, said something that I found very interesting um, because you said exactly the same thing and you hadn't read that article. Mm. Um, he said 
uh, the two leads didn't have any chemistry together. None which whatsoever. You, which you specifically called out, um, which I, I agreed with. I think they thought they were being like kind of funny and like John Lithgow's very tall and like Norbert Leo Butts is not very tall. And like they're like, it's one's tall and one's short. Like that's a funny physical joke. And that was not. Just, yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I don't know. I just keep coming back to the whole thing about how this is a producer's ripoff. Mm-hmm. Like it's doing, It's you mentioned before, it breaks the fourth wall constantly. It makes all these jokes about the set and how it's a show. It's just designed for tourists. Mm-hmm. Like it's not designed to be a good show. It's designed to make money. Yeah. Uh, only. Yeah. And I just, I didn't appreciate that. The horniness though, this really ratchets up the horniness in a way that I didn't really enjoy. Yeah. And it really goes towards... I would say like college kid level horniness. Uh-huh. It's very horny. Yeah. And it's more like, it's the kind of like, we're, we're, everyone's talking about this right now with Hamilton, where the Hamilton movie is rated PG-13 because famously there's three fucks in the show, but you can't have three fucks in a PG-13 movie. You have to get rid of two of them. And so they got rid of my favorite one. I know, I know. I think a lot of people feel that way. They got rid of Hercules Mulligan. But like, if we wanted Hamilton to be rated R, we can keep our fucks. If we are okay with it being <laughs> PG-13, then we get two less fucks yeah and everyone will just sing along anyway it doesn't matter but on the stage you can say as many fucks as you want you can do as much of that stuff as you want and i feel like this really leans into that a little bit not not that it's super blue but that it's kind of out of place when it does swear Mm -hmm. because they don't even really swear in dirty rotten scoundrels no and also because it's such a traditional musical theater show that doesn't usually have a lot of swearing in it that when they do swear it like feels very like very grating like it feels very strange it just feels like they couldn't come up with a better line yeah it feels like lazy writing yeah and i'm not usually one to say like obviously not because we use so much profanity on this show like oh well if you use profanity clearly it's just because you couldn't think of any better way to say it but like that's how it does feel in this yeah they couldn't think of anything clever so they just like threw in a fuck to shock people yeah but also to to that point we make up this show as we go (laughs) this is a (laughs) fully improvised show it's not lazy writing (laughs) It's lazy non-writing. We don't write anything down. It's a very lazy show. Um, I will say just quickly, we did not call out uh, Sherry Renee Scott plays the female lead and she is she is fine. She's fine. Actually, I think she's less than fine yeah. um, in this because I think she's okay as like the who we think she is. Mm-hmm. But then when she shows up at the end as the jackal, as yeah. the, the other con artist, I don't buy her at all. Honestly, I'm not even sure she's that great at who, who quote, who we think she is because I don't think she ha- – she seems very confident. Like she doesn't seem like sweet and innocent in that Glenn – Headley way she's like she's very tall she's very commanding you know yeah she didn't really do it for me I found out something amazing she played April O'Neil in the coming out of their shells tour which if anyone else remembers (laughs) any same gender Ninja Turtles is a rock show musical Mm -hmm. I have the cassette tape I got it from Pizza Hut she was also the original um she was also in the original cast of the last five years, which is her and Norbert Leo Butts. It's a two character show. And, um, but more was, importantly, she was April O'Neil in the coming out of their shells. She video. was Ursula in the little mermaid, the Broadway production, the original cast. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Huh? Well, she was a little older at okay. that point. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. This was just, it was, I'm glad we watched it because we have context now, mm-hmm. but l- l- it's just not like, we laughed a little bit. Yeah. But it's like constantly breaking the fourth wall. It's constantly trying to distract you from the faults of the show. Yeah. It's distracting you with, just like oh we're gonna reference that we're on a set and it's moving right now to distract you from the fact that nothing really funny is happening so we're just going to make you realize you're in it's a musical it's it's a we're gonna break the fourth wall Yeah, like i mean like listen if your friend is in it at in your local theater which i think they actually just did it at our local theater i think think arlington friends of the drama did it their last season Mm. um you know, don't not go see your friend in their show because we said we didn't really like the Broadway production. But like, there's no need to seek it out if you if, if you don't you have can, any connection to it. You can always blame our reaction on the fact that we watched it in a context that it was not meant to be seen, which yes. is a shitty bootleg. Not how you should watch theater. on YouTube. Tw- Filmed 20, through someone's coat like 20 years ago. 20 years ago. <laughs> And we had to find it and watch three hours of it while everyone else was watching Hamilton this a- weekend. And I couldn't even really look at the screen because it was giving me motion sickness and making me dizzy. But that's Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, the musical 2004. Whew. Now Moving we're on. on to our last adaptation because in 2019, they made The Hustle. Do The Hustle. Do The Hustle. Da, 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 da. Do The Hustle. Okay. It's been stuck in my head. This... I don't want to say how we felt about it okay. just yet. Let's hold off on that for a minute. 
Want to talk a little bit about some background? That cool with you? Uh, yes. So this was in development for a number of years. Uh, a lot of different people were attached to it. Um, originally, it was going to. It was not going to be titled "The Hustle." Do you know what it was going to be called? Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. No, it wasn't because uh, they knew from the beginning that it was going to be switching the genders uh-huh. and that we were going to get some ladies in the lead roles in this. And I don't actually. Now that I think about it, can a woman be a scoundrel? Yeah, why not? I just have never heard that. I mean, Can you I name feel me like, a woman that's ever been referred to as a scoundrel? I feel like Dirty Rotten Scoundrels encompasses Glenn Headley by the end of the movie. I feel like she is now part of the scoundrels. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway. I didn't want to talk about Donald Trump again, but oh. this was originally titled Nasty Women. Okay. Which, if you're going to title a movie, definitely title it something that Donald Trump said against Hillary Clinton in a presidential debate. Uh, that's that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. They t- decided to not do that. Mm-hmm. And instead, they called it The Hustle. Mm-hmm. Uh, this uh, was produced by Rebel Wilson, one of the stars and her production company. Mm-hmm. It was written by <laughs> Dale Lawner, Shapiro, and Henning. They all got credit because not only is this a remake of Bedtime Story, it's not even really a remake of Bedtime Story. Other than there's like one line. They reference they, they reference it in one line just so we know that they know that it was a, an original 1964 film. Maybe. Like Anna Hathaway does say like, I'll tell you a bedtime story. Yes. Which I'd say like is a 90% chance that it's a reference to the original. Yes. But it was written, this version was written by uh, Jack Schaefer. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has written a number of different things. I actually found this fascinating because I hadn't heard her name before. She's super big for Marvel Studios. Mm. Uh, she wrote on the script for Captain Marvel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She wrote on the script for Black Widow, mm-hmm. which has still not come out be- due to COVID. And she is the showrunner for WandaVision uh, that is going to be on Disney+. Plus. Cool. So she's 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 someone who's like, she's done things that I, I enjoy. Mm-hmm. I really, really enjoyed Captain Marvel. Uh, it was directed by Chris Addison. He's a, an actor and comedian. He was in The Thick of It and In the Loop, mm-hmm. which were co-created, which were created by Armando Iannucci, who also did Veep. He went on to direct 13 episodes of Veep. He co-created a show called Breeders with Martin Freeman that came out this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, co-created a show called Lab Rats that was really well received. He's apparently a popular comedian and a comic actor. So I would say there's like some good people involved in this. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Anne Hathaway as Josephine Chesterfield, mm-hmm. who is the new Lawrence Jameson part, and Rebel Wilson as Penny Ross the new uh freddie benson Mm -hmm. part and we have this movie and it came out last year and it wasn't well received and we watched it a couple of days ago and it was not well received by us not in this house it uh ooh. why why does this keep happening i I don't know why is this another one where like the most recent version is one we didn't like and we have to end our show on i mean i was perfectly prepared that you know, before we sat down to watch it, you said to me it was not very well received and didn't go very many places. And I was perfectly prepared that it was going to be really great and charming and that much like Lady Ghostbusters, I would love it and f- see myself in it and be very touched and moved. And everyone else is an idiot and a jerk. That did not prove to be the case. Um, I did not care for it. First of all, like talk about <laughs> talk about a horny movie. This is, Jesus Christ. This is horny like a 12-year-old is horny. Yeah. So horny in a very unsophisticated way. I found the horniness distasteful. And again, I feel like I'm defending myself against my own self-accusation of being a prude like many, many times in this episode. So like maybe this is just me. I just, ugh, it was yucky. It was, it was gross. There was just so many like gross sex jokes in it. I don't like it. Do you agree or I, do you think I'm too sensitive to it? No, I think the sex in this movie was gross. Yeah. I think it's a gross bad movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I hated it. <laughs> I hated how it was written. I hated the changes that it made. I hated how much potential it just lost. Like w- one thing that I did expect going into it was that I would not dislike. I don't want to make an assumption about everyone, mm-hmm. but I do think there is a large number of people who are not fans of Rebel Wilson. Mm-hmm. Much in the same way that when we did Arthur, that I knew going into it, there are a lot of people who don't really like Russell Brand's uh, thing. Kind of thing. Um, I being one of them. <laughs> yeah, I really like Russell Brand. I think he's really funny, and I really enjoyed him in Arthur, even though we didn't really enjoy the movie mm-hmm. that much. Um, but I kind of went through that defending him, mm-hmm. and I think he was pretty right for it. Rebel Wilson's one of these people like I think she's kind of funny like when she does the right thing I think she's kind of funny she does one thing I don't think she has a ton of range um, and you're putting her up against Anne Hathaway someone who has a literal lot of, Oscar winner like a lot of range yes. Ge- a genuine amount of range I've seen her in many different things that I've really enjoyed her in I wanted to go through this defending Rebel Wilson mm-hmm. but 
I can't mm-hmm. because I think she was miscast in this and I think the writing did her no favors. And I genuinely don't understand how based on the people that made it and the fact that they are clearly capable of doing things that I think are well-written and well-made and that I enjoy and that other people enjoy, make this, which doesn't feel like anyone in particular was involved. Mm-hmm. It feels like a movie made by a computer. Yeah. <laughs> that was just looked at like, okay, here's every comedy made from 2010 on, feed into the algorithm and have it spit out a super, super horny version of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Yeah. I mean... Other than the fact that they switched the genders, I mean, you don't really need to know any other addition to the plot other than like the American is this young kid that like has a bunch of money or so they think from he's inventing like a, an he's app. like a tech mogul. Yeah. Tech mogul. And then it turns out he doesn't really have a lot of money, but he's a nice, he seems like he's a nice kid. And then he does fleece them for like a million dollars between them. There's a lot of like exact reckoning about exact amounts of money in this that like I was so confused about why they were being so specific like I've made this much money how much money do you have I have this much money how much money do you have I have a thought about that yes I'm gonna make a wild assumption yes this is the kind of movie you get when you take the studio's notes Mm -hmm. because this to me felt like the punch-up version of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels Mm -hmm. how much do you know about punch-up I don't know punch-up is what happens when you have your screenplay, okay, I'm, I'm a studio head, and I say, cool, I have this screenplay for this new movie is coming out. I've read it, but I don't know anything about good stuff, so I don't know if it's good or not. But I do feel like it doesn't have enough jokes in it. You know what? The script can always be better. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to send it to one of our writers, and they're going to do some punch-up on it. And they're going to look through the entire thing, and they're not going to give us anything like earth-shattering that we need to do. They're not going to change the plot or change characters around. Just going to add some jokes. They're just going to make sure that they can find every single opportunity to add a joke. Mm-hmm. I'll try to find it. Patton Oswalt did an amazing routine <laughs> about the work he's done doing punch-up. Yeah. That I'm not going to repeat. I'm not just going to like do his jokes. But it is a, an amazing routine that I think is really a kind of explains the topic really well i'll try to link to that in the show notes but it is something that i've become like personally i've become more and more aware of as years have gone on and you can like watch a movie and when you become aware of it the punch-up jokes really stand out Mm -hmm. so like here's a way to spot a punch-up joke if you hear the character say it but you don't see them say it it's probably a punch-up joke. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a scene in this movie where Rebel Wilson and Anne Hathaway fight, and Rebel Wilson storms out of the room. By all accounts, the scene is over. Like, the uh, dramatic arc of the scene has finished, and it's kept you guessing. You don't quite know where it's going to go. You know there's going to be more story after that. But as she's leaving the room, you watch Rebel Wilson walk away, and you hear Anne Hathaway say the start of a joke, and then as she's leaving, Rebel Wilson says says the punchline to it. And it's just a way for them to call each other shitty in some way. I can't even remember what the line was. But you don't see either of their mouths move. Mm-hmm. And they sound a little weird. It sounds like ADR. And it was clearly added later. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of shit that I don't like. Yeah. And I brought up that thing at the beginning that Shapiro said about jokes. I brought it up to talk about this one. Because this comedy has too many jokes in it. Yeah. Way too many. How many was I pointing out by the time the movie was done? I, I got real mad. Yeah, you you were angry about the, the jokes. You were like, everything has to have a button. Why does everything have to have a button? Like every scene has to end with a joke. Like one of the things that I really like about this story is that the dramatic arc of it, the actual character motivations, makes sense. It's a really clear story. You know who the characters are. You know what their motivations are. And the comedy comes out of the fact that they're in conflict with each other. You don't necessarily need to end every scene with one of them saying, like, something shitty about their butthole. Yeah. Like, way too many scenes end with someone talking about something scatological or something sexual that comes out of nowhere and has nothing to do with the plot or the characters. Yeah. I mean, once again, I found myself watching something that I had seen three different versions of at that point and still was confused about the plot. And also, like... It was weird that I was confused about the plot because, as you say, they put in a bunch of jokes and they also explained the jokes a lot of the time. Yeah. And explained, like over-explained what was going on. And I still didn't understand what was going on. That's the punch-up that I'm talking about. Because that's another thing that happens in punch-up is like basically 
I'm, I, other people have said this better than I have, but basically like a producer looks at it and goes like, well, in this scene, they don't have a hat. In this scene, they do have a hat. How did they, how did they get the hat? And the writer goes like, well, no one's going to be confused about that. And they go like, well, I'm confused about it, so you need to fix it. So they need to explain it in the script. Yeah. So I think going back to what you were saying about the money, I think this was someone saying, there's too many numbers flying around. This needs to be clarified. Mm-hmm. You need to, we really need to explain what these numbers are all coming from and we need to explain what's happening and i think that's why there's so much of that shittiness in the movie yeah it just had the effect of making it more confusing but i'm going to talk about one thing very quickly that i liked very (laughs) briefly and then i'm going to talk about the biggest problem that i had um so really quickly i liked the new character of um andre i liked her her woman police detective Uh, i thought it was cool that that character was also gender swapped as a woman and i thought she was great and funny and had some good lines and was very french and very funny she was funny yeah she didn't do the joseph goebbels joke no she wouldn't really maybe it doesn't work in 2019 i'm not sure it works in 2019 but okay so we've talked about like the script wasn't great and the acting was maybe not amazing and the two uh, women didn't have a ton of chemistry and maybe there was some miscasting and like maybe too many people had their hands on the script but i had a huge problem with the overarching concept that i don't think anything could have fixed because i had a major problem with the gender swap and the problem that i had is that i know that someone had this cool idea like oh we're going to make more movies about women let's find movies that originally were about men and make them about women which is fine i really liked the new ghostbusters and if you didn't like it i urge you to watch it again with an open heart In this particular movie, reversing the genders makes it less progressive. Reversing the genders, like, takes it back 50 years. It makes it it reactionary for a couple of reasons. One, the way that these women are just, like, bilking men out of their money, it's just a movie about, like, about gold diggers it's just a movie uh, they don't do anything to make it more interesting or more clever it's just a movie about these these evil evil women tricking men out of their money with their with their good looks and the promise of sex can i add a thing really quickly yes just to illustrate that so like in the originals Lawrence's whole plot is I'm going to convince these women that I am banished royalty mm-hmm. and it's going to excite them yeah and that's how I will bring them into my web yes in this like Anne Hathaway's her character Josephine Josephine's whole thing is I'm just gonna act really stupid Mm -hmm. and be a dumb lady and trick them that way and then I'll bilk them while they're looking at me Mm -hmm. which is not I mean to your point that is a huge regression yes but then the other thing is I I wonder if at any point in the development process of this script Someone went, hey, wait a second. If we flip the genders so that the young Mark is... It's funny because it's like Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. The young Mark is now like a young man, like a, a young kid. And then it turns out he's the biggest con artist all along. And then he comes back at the end and he's like, hey, I made so much money last year. You guys want to like join me and we can be a team? Like, did anyone think about the fact that the that makes the moral of this story oh all of all that these women needed to be more successful was a male boss like literally that's what we walk away with that's how we end the movie all these girls needed was a man to show them how to how to really get this done and like i don't think anyone associated with the movie actually thought that that's what the script was saying i think if you ask the writers of the script they'd be like no of course that's not what we were explicitly implying but that has the effect of of doing so and it was a really shitty message to walk away with and left a bad taste in my mouth Mm -hmm. so female character underwritten i just really i keep coming back to the fact that i really feel like this movie i'm not saying it shouldn't have made it past development but i think it it went into production too fast like there needed to be someone to step in to say like there we've got to make some more changes to it Mm -hmm. like the decisions that are being made are not the right decisions like I genuinely don't think Rebel Wilson was right for this part. Yeah. I, I don't think this was a good part for her. Mm-hmm. I don't think it fits with her brand of comedy. Yeah. Like the whole thing is in all of the original versions, Freddie is a ne'er-do-well, but in the moment he can convince someone that he's being genuine. Mm-hmm. And her whole thing was the comedy comes from just how raunchy she's being and how inappropriate she's being. Yeah. So she'll sit down in front of someone she's never met to con them 
And she will end up conning them because that's what the plot requires. And that's what the script is saying. But as an audience member, I don't buy for a second that they would be brought in by her con. Because she's not sympathetic. Even a little. Yeah. Not at all. So I just, I don't think she was right for this. And I don't think the script was doing her any favors. I will go out on a limb and I will say that I think Anne Hathaway should be in this movie. Mm. But I don't think they cast her in the right part. Mm. I don't think she should have been the new Lawrence. I think she should have been the new Freddy. Mm. And I think we talked about this a little bit before before we recorded. We each have a person in our head that we think should have been like the Lawrence character. Yeah. I mean, I liked your idea fine, too. Yeah. Well, who did you say? I said Helen Mirren. And I said Emma Thompson. Yeah, which is kind of along the same lines. Like, if you're going to gender swap, don't... Uh, the thing that makes the plot work is that you have like a younger man and an older man who are at different periods in their life. They have different things they're looking out for. When you do Rebel Wilson and Anne Hathaway, you're just saying, oh, they're both young women. Mm -hmm. And Anne Hathaway is like, okay in this, but the version of the character doesn't work for me Mm -hmm. because she's way too young for the things that she's doing. Yeah. Um, They also, just as a quick aside, they add in so many things like for for jokes, it's all for jokes, but the whole scene where she's like, training rebel wilson to be her protege involves way too many scenes of like training her for physical activity like knife throwing (laughs) and like doing hurdles yeah it doesn't make any sense which we never see them do at all for any reason they are never called upon to do it it doesn't go anywhere what is would you say i want to give some of your credentials right now uh what is your highest degree i have a Masters of Fine Arts. In what field? Dramaturgy. Would you say that something you really enjoy doing in your spare time is kind of like analyzing the works of Shakespeare? Is that something that you find fun? In, in what spare time I have. Okay. I used to. Okay. Just as an example. Yes. What I'm saying is like you're a person who likes the finer things. Yes. What's a thing that happens in movies and TV shows that you happen to love more than anything? Um, I think it's really funny when people fall down. <laughs> Why is this like comedy crack to Ariel Lipshaw? <laughs> I don't know. There's so many falls in this movie. I laughed at every single one of them. And they don't all work. No. They're pretty bad. But I just, I I just delight in how much you delight in people falling down. It's so funny when she falls down. <laughs> that you were going to give a specific one. Like, I like people falling down too. I'm not saying it's not something to laugh at. I just think it's really funny that it's like the funniest thing you have ever seen. I love it. And I love you. And it's really endearing. I'm just thinking about people falling down and laughing. <laughs> So there's a lot of falls in this movie. It doesn't make any sense. It has nothing to do with the plot. It's just there. But I think if they had changed, if they had made some pretty fundamental changes, like one, fewer jokes, focus more on the story, cast someone like Emma Thompson or Helen Mirren in the lead, and then put Anne Hathaway in the younger role, and also figure your shit out about how the plot happens in the third act, like who their mark is and what their relationship to him is. If you figure that shit out, I still think there might be a pretty good movie here because I think the story is really compelling. But the version of the movie that we got was just, I just think, wrong. Yeah. I think it was really wrong. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the the big problem I had with the ending, I know I said it was it was insurmountable. But, like, I wonder if you could just kind of fix it by acknowledging it within the script. Like, having one of them say to him something to the effect of what like you think we just need some dude to come and tell us what to do and then he could say i made eight billion dollars last year and then then look at each other go great cool you know like have some reasoning behind it and just acknowledge that that's the optics of what's happening um and they're choosing to do that anyway i think that would be a step towards fixing it yeah like if we're whiteboarding here like blow up his spot like when he shows up with all those people at the end Call him out in front of these people. Mm -hmm. Get back at him for what he did to them. Yeah. You know? Because it's the other thing that makes it so satisfying in the original Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is that even before she comes back, Lawrence's reaction, as you say, to her like flying away after he realizes what she's done, he's delighted Mm -hmm. by it. So when they see her again, you you believe that he's actually happy to see her. Yeah. He's happy to be involved in this. That never happens in this one. Yeah. In this one, Anne Hathaway fucking hates this guy. Yeah. She's so angry about it. They're both so angry about it. Also, neither of them really have the moral high ground because the thing happens where it turns out, oh, he doesn't really have the money, but it's Rebel Wilson that finds out. They flip that part of it. Uh-huh. But they still agree that the bet should be whoever can sleep with him first. Yeah. No one takes the moral high ground at any point. Yes. So... They're kind of worse people. 
than yeah. the original. Yeah. It doesn't, I it, that doesn't work either. Yes. Hort- and Hortense wasn't as good as Ruprecht. Like, she just wasn't. No. The whole thing didn't work for me. That was, she's like the, the inbred sister and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work. Because the whole point of that plot too wasn't about getting money from all of these guys. She, Anne Hathaway was convincing all of these guys to propose with these giant engagement rings. And then they would scare the guy away with Hortense, the, the inbred sister. And then they would keep the rings. Mm -hmm. But like, how much of a market is there for used jewelry? I can tell you, not that much. Yeah, not a lot. Not a lot. And so even their plot seems really low stakes. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I could go on and on. Yes. I don't want to go on and on. Mm-hmm. I, I did not enjoy this movie at all. Yes. Um, but uh, man, I came out of this with like a much greater appreciation for Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Me too. Of all what we saw, I'd, I'd watch it again. Yeah. It is definitely like the new original version. I feel like that happens with remakes a lot of times where like, I think people going back now, if anyone's going to do this story again, they're not doing it because of Niven and Brando and Jones and Bedtime Story. They're doing it because of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Especially because as you say, that that movie is hard to get your hands on. It really is. We had a tough time. Do you want to go back and do some quadrants before we finish up? Yes. So going back, what do you think of 1988's Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Mm-hmm. Do you think that they cared about the source material being a bedtime story? No, I actually really don't. I don't think so either. Yeah. I don't think that's how this works. Was it successful? Yes. Yeah. Someone asked us recently, can you name an example of something that didn't care about the source material but was also successful? So we should add this to our like little mental list of one that we can point to. Someone asked us on the Castle of Horror podcast there it is. that we appeared. Uh, we were interviewed on that. I mentioned it last time, but if you haven't heard it, you should check out that episode. It came out about a month or two ago. It was a super, super fun conversation we had. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, here's an example. Okay, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, the musical. Do you think they cared about the source material being bedtime story? No, no. I, I think they cared about the, the producers and wanted to have another hit. Uh, yeah, what's a notch? What's above a, What's one notch above not caring completely? Because there was a reference to David Niven in the mm, show. Okay, so they get like... A- C minus. Yeah, it's not an F. It's like a D. Yeah. Essentially. They get they get something for that. Was it successful? I didn't care for it. I if didn't we're care judging for it, it on its like on what it was trying to be, like it was commercially kind of successful. I, I didn't think it was that good. I mean, I feel like when we say was it successful, that never has to do with that side. No, of I it. know. I, I just no. I would say it was not successful. I agree with you. 2019's The Hustle. Yes. Do you think they cared about the source material? <sighs> No, probably. I mean, a little bit. We think there was a reference to it somewhere. I think Dirty Rotten Scout. Well, okay. Bedtime story? Yes. No. I don't think they cared about Except it. Except when they referenced it. Which I, I, but for whatever reason, that doesn't feel like caring about it to me. Gotcha. I can't explain why. All right. And I don't feel like I should have to explain why on the <laughs> show where I explain how I feel about things. Uh, was it successful? No. 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 It was not. No. But I'm glad we watched all of these. Yeah, it was Super, fun. They were really fun. It was fun. Watch Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. If you haven't seen any of these, watch Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Yeah. And if you like weird mid-career Marlon Brando, definitely check out Bedtime Story. Oh, boy. That he made, what, eight years before The Godfather? It's really strange. Super weird. Well, this has been Adapter Parish. If you'd like to find us online, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AdaptCast. And if you tweet about the show, don't forget to use the AdaptCast hashtag. You can join our groups on Facebook and Goodreads, and you can also find and follow me on Letterboxd. If you have anything to say that's longer than a tweet, you can always send an email to adapterparishcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, there are two great ways you can do it. First, tell a friend. Second, a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice would be greatly appreciated. Do you want to talk about our Patreon? Yeah, so we started this Patreon. We've been talking about it for a while. We feel pretty embarrassed to ask people for money, especially in these times. But I feel like whenever I give money to Patreon or some kind of subscription, like I think about the amount of entertainment that I'm that I'm getting. So like if there's a YouTuber that I really like and I think, you know, what, I don't mind essentially paying a dollar to watch each one of their videos like that. That seems fair. Um, I believe in paying content creators and this show is absolutely free. will always be free. Mm-hmm. We don't even really have an option to make it not free. <laughs> that platform does not exist. But even if we did, we wouldn't do it. Even if we did, we wouldn't do it. I'd, I'd like to think we wouldn't do it. But it is interesting that like unlike YouTube that has this platform that 
provides an avenue for monetization. There's really nothing like that for podcasting, which on the one hand is good because you can just do whatever you want. and You don't have to like be um, enthralled to YouTube's magic algorithm um, and and really dependent on that platform. But on the other hand, it is harder to, you know, just kind of cover the costs of your own show. So, you know, we pay for hosting space and microphones and I'm unemployed. Uh, we, we have to pay a lot of money to watch a lot of bad content sometimes, which is really unfortunate. And all of our scre- streaming service subscriptions. Um, so there is a little bit of a cost. In not, that, not that the Patreon money is going towards the streaming service because no, 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 I do no. watch Stranger Things and I, I do that for me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we try to get, I mean, here's a really great example. Like we try to get books out of the library whenever we possibly can, but the libraries have all been closed for three There's months. There's that. So not that we've done anything that needed a book for a while because we have a child but just just like stuff like that there's like we we want to we we don't um like pirate anything we we try to pay when we can when there's something that is available for purchase we will purchase it um and pay money towards the creators so that we can give them shit for their terrible movies um so you know that is all a cost that goes into into this show yeah so anyway all this is to say um we're actually pretty excited about some of the things that we want to do for subscribers um and jeremy is going to talk about that so we have we we thought really hard about what were some of the uh rewards we were going to give um to the people that decided to patronize us uh because as we say like the show is free and will always be free if you do not want to contribute to the patreon that is completely completely fine we still hope you stick around and we love you uh but if you do decide that you are in a place where you want to contribute to the patreon we're going to do three different levels so the first level is going to be general patron so that is one dollar a month you're contributing to the show we love you i do this personally for a lot of podcasters and youtubers and people that i really enjoy um so that is going to be the first level right there the second level is going to be the bonus show patron. So this is going to be $3 a month. If you pay the $3 a month, you are going to, of course, be contributing to the show, contributing to all of the things that go into making the show and contributing to our costs. But we are also doing a bonus show that you will get the podcast feed to. In fact, we have already recorded the first couple of episodes of the bonus show. And at the end of this episode, at the end of this kind of outro, you're going to get about five minutes from the first episode of the bonus show. And the best way to describe what the show is about is that there's a lot of stuff that we want to talk about and we enjoy talking about that doesn't really make sense to talk about on this show. Um, In that little preview, you'll hear a little bit more about that. The episodes are going to be about a half an hour long, and they're going to come out on alternating weeks from Adapter Parish. So every other Tuesday, you'll get this show, and then on alternating Tuesdays, you'll get the patron-only show. So that's a bonus show patron. And then our final tier is going to be the all-access patron. So that's $5 a month. You are supporting the show. You have access to the bonus show, but we would also love to invite you to join us in our show Slack channel. Uh, We have a Slack group that we set up. We really love the idea of having community and we love talking to people. We talk to a lot of you through Twitter. We have somewhat of a presence on Facebook. I'll just say this. I would love to spend less time on Facebook. I have not set foot on Facebook since March and I am I miss some things about it in terms of communities I'm a part of, but I don't see myself returning anytime soon. Yeah. So rather than really, because we have a fan group on there, and there's a number of you that are a part of it and we like seeing posts and we like engaging, but it doesn't really happen very much. Slack is just a great way to have our, a little private community where if you just want to chat with us, we're in there and you can just be in there with us and you can ask us questions and we can do polls and we can do fun things. We can let you know anything that we're working on, things that we're thinking about. And I'll say this, if we're going to announce anything, the first place we're going to announce it is going to be in the Slack group. Mm -hmm. So if you want more access to us and you just want to talk more about the kind of things that we talk about on the show, that is absolutely the best place to do it. And so that level of patronage will get you access to the Adapter Parish Slack. That is our Patreon. These tiers may change over time. We may do additional bonuses. We're still thinking about it. We're just starting this whole thing. We can send stuff out. Like, we just haven't really thought about it. We're thinking about stickers because stickers are super fun. We have stickers. I love stickers, but we're trying to come up with, like, a good way to, to package that. Uh, but that's our Patreon. Yeah. And I, I know we've said it multiple times, and I just want to reiterate, this show is free and will always be free, and you don't have to be a patron to enjoy this show. Yeah. But... If you're the type of person that is in a position to and has a desire to help support us and help make the show happen, 
we are going to give you a way to do that. Um, and that's going to be at patreon.com slash adaptcast. Mm-hmm. And we'll put all this information and links and everything on the show notes. We'll put them on Instagram, everything like that. So you will have easy access to all of this information. And yeah, we hope to see you there. Yeah. And for people who aren't going to contribute, I just want you to know, it's not like we're going to talk about the Patreon all the time on the show. No. This isn't going to be the show where we're just using it as a way to get people to our Patreon. Yeah. The show will still be the show. Yeah. Do you want to do a funny quote from Dirty Rotten Scoundrels before we go into the preview of the uh, patron podcast? Even if they trace it to him, what can they do? It was a great line. It's so good. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome to what? Do you, what are we calling this? What Ad- are we? What are you, Adapter Parish. Adapter Parish After Dark. Adapter Parish Nights. I like Adapter Parish Plus. Okay. Because it's like I feel like that's how all these services are working. Do now. you like, think Disney's going to come after us though? I mean, I would e- say if like, only Disney knew that we existed. Yeah, like Hulu Plus. Well, I guess that's Disney too. Uh huh. Oh man. Netflix Plus. Is that a thing? Netflix, no, Netflix is just Netflix. Slate Plus. You can do that. What is it? Slate Plus. What's that? For Slate? Slate? Yeah. What's Slate? A new, Slate? A news and current events website? Oh, Slate. 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 Yeah, Slate. I know what Slate is. It feels so freeing to do a show that we did no <laughs> prep for. I like... Freeing I feel like one word for it. The shackles are off. This is amazing. What this, are you drinking, Jeremy? I am drinking a Negroni right now. Mm-hmm. What are you drinking? I, you made it. What is it? It's a Boulevardier. Which is the same thing. They're basically the same thing. It was easy enough to do both of them. It was totally fine. I like the Boulevardier because it has more liquor in it. Uh, a Negroni is 111, but a Boulevardier is 211. Yeah, but if you do 111, but I do like a little bit more than one, Uh huh. It's this is not a three ounce drink over here. This is like a four ounce drink over here. Okay. I just The proportions have to be right for the taste to be good. Right. Mm-hmm. I do like a Boulevardier. Yeah. Um, so everyone, just so everyone knows, this is a, this is a drink show. This is a show where we talk about cocktails. We, I mean, do you want it to be that? We it could be. be. That. It, this can be whatever we want. We don't know exactly what this show is going to be. We have some ideas. Um, I will tell you that today's episode is not going to be about drinks. We have an idea for what today's episode is going to be about. Mm-hmm. But we, this show is not always going to be one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, like, you, you know what I'm not ruling out? We might want to do an entire episode just where we talk about Hamilton. Because, mm-hmm. like, that's a thing we want to watch and a thing we want to talk about that we're never really going to talk about on the show. Like, somehow we found ourselves doing the kind of podcast that I never, ever listen to and never, ever want to do, which is just, like, three dudes sitting in a room going, we just talk about stuff, man. Like, this is just us talking. Well, we're going to, but that's what we're not going to do. Okay. That's not what this is because we're going to have a structure and we're going to, you and me are going to decide before we start what it is. Mm -hmm. Like we've already decided on what this episode is right now, but I don't think we're ever going to sit down and say, man, episode uh, 17 of Adapter Parish Nights. I don't know what we're going to be talking about. How how you how you doing? How you doing? Well, we're definitely not going to do that kind of show because look, look, can I try it out? Yeah. How you doing? Everything's terrible. Yeah. See, I don't want to do this show. It's a bullshit fucking show. We actually, we got a really nice iTunes review today, um, and it was very sweet, and one of the things she said was that she wanted to be our friend. Um, which is the sweetest thing in the world. Which is just so sweet, and um, so think of this as your opportunity to be our friend. Engage is- with us on a... More personal level. Yeah. So By instead paying of... us money for access to the show. <laughs> we appreciate your patronage. God, that's really bleak. It is, yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, we appreciate that you're here. We appreciate your patronage. As as of this recording, you are still unemployed. Yeah, I was just going to say the exact same, <laughs> literally word for word what I was about to say. <laughs> Oh, I love not having to prepare for something. This is great. God. How many movies did we have to watch to do this episode? Uh, none. And it's just so funny because I just feel as amped up and nervous as I always do but I think it's just because I don't do nearly as much preparation as you do so it feels pretty much the same you come across on the show as not being nervous at all but like I see it uh-huh. I see how nervous you get about doing this show mm-hmm. has it ever stopped no what is the what is the period of time like between for you between when we're done recording and I give you the first like edited version to listen to what do you mean what's that period of time like for you what do you how do you think you did oh I always think I did terrible and was stupid mm-hmm. and sounded bad and was not interesting and then when you get the edited version of the it always episode, sounds fine it always sounds fine it always sounds fine it sounds like I mean, Although, it sounds as good as, as our show ever is i mean the I, I always feel like if the the closer we record to the time that you edit the worse i think it sounds like if it's been a <laughs> oh, gap of like two weeks or more i'm always like i forgot i said that funny thing <laughs> 
Oh, it's a delight. Yeah. We're fans of our own show. I, I, maybe I shouldn't say that yeah, on the show. Yeah, don't say that. That's terrible. Thank you all for giving us money. We're also it's fans of our show. Very self-congratulatory. We get it for free, except it's not. It costs money to do this show. But I, well, let's get to it, because I don't, these episodes, this can't be a two-hour show. This this needs to be like a cool 30 minutes, uh, you know, 30 minutes for an hour. Mm-hmm. That's I think that's what we're <laughs> aiming for with, with Adapter Parish Nights. Adapter Parish Plus. Age 30 for nine. <laughs> if you uh, got that reference, you can definitely be my friend. Absolutely. Even if you didn't get Even it, we you, can be I mean, friends. Because like, then then we can hang out and we and you can say, well, you've never seen the trip. Let's watch the trip together. Yeah. Let's do that. I'd love to watch the trip with someone who hasn't seen it before. That would be awesome. That's the thing. We See, we, that's the thing. We could do a thing on this show. We could do like watch parties. I was actually thinking about this. Here are some ideas that I had for different uh, episodes <laughs> that we could do for Adapter <laughs> Parish Plus. This is what it's like to live with Jeremy. I have ideas. Just turn to you go here's some ideas that i had for this thing that you didn't know that i was talking about but i've done a lot of research and i'd like to share my thoughts i've done a little bit on it so i was thinking like one thing we could do is uh let's call them pitch meetings or pitch sessions or something like that that's actually what we're going to do today where we talk about things that we love that either have never been adapted into another medium or have been but like not the way we wanted or we want something else so that's what today's gonna be i was thinking of another one we could do a whole uh, series of shows that are just called leave it alone where it's like there's a thing that exists and we never want it adapted ever for reasons that we can get into in those episodes uh-huh. i thought we could just have some general like chat sessions uh-huh. i mentioned hamilton mm-hmm. that could be a fun one to just mm-hmm. like let's just talk about hamilton yeah or whatever we want to uh i was thinking of another one how do you feel about hasn't aged well where we could talk about <laughs> like a thing we we used to love that we rewatched and found out that it is not as good now as it was when we were younger it's a good one i think that might be kind of fun and they're like not really on brand for adapter parish but you know what they're on brand for jeremy latour and Ariel lipshaw yeah which is what you're paying for yeah yeah i watched um the documentary disclosure today on netflix um do you want to save that for a chat session i do want to save it for a chat session but i will say like that is literally on the theme of things that haven't aged well because it's about the representation of trans people in media um the entire time you were telling me about it what was the thing i kept asking you said have they talked about ace ventura yet have they talked about ace ventura yet and i was like no they haven't mentioned it and then there's this, this guy this trans guy who's like um so ace ventura was my favorite movie growing up I hadn't seen it for a long time. I was in college. I was transitioning. I, I was left like, the room I was in to come join you to yeah, watch this segment. He was like, I I just wanted some like comfort viewing. And I guess the whole denouement of Ace Ventura is like a trans joke, like like a really violent, like horrible forced outing of a, a trans woman. Like it's it's a kid's movie. Like it, it was so crazy. Yeah. I did not know that at all that movie's been problematic for a long time yeah um i don't think i've ever seen it but anyway um it's a really amazing documentary it's called disclosure it's on netflix uh it's fantastic Mm -hmm. so anyway those are some of my ideas for things that we could do on this show adapter parish plus uh but let's do pitch sessions do you want to do a pitch session right now uh yeah you said you'd go first though yeah i brought something to the table i would like to talk about this property it is crazy to me that this has never been adapted into anything because i fucking loved it when i was a kid i read it all the time it was never a tv show it was never a miniseries it was never a tv movie it was never a theatrical movie but I want to talk about what do I want to talk about? This is actually me from the present now. This is now what you're hearing is not from the bonus episode. I'm going to cut it off there, but we would all love for you to listen to the Patreon podcast and we would all love to see you on Patreon. Thank you all so much and uh, we love you and stay safe and stay active. <laughs>